Today we are talking with Professor John Youth, a Professor of Science in the Physics Departments at the Harvard University and the author of The Lost Art of Finding a Way. Welcome to Ridera. Hi, thank you for calling. You're welcome. We all have been navigators and even distant ancestors of ours uh, managed to travel vast distances uh, without the help of the modern technology. How can you, can you narrate a little bit or give us a little bit of backdrop of how humans have been traveling or covering vast distances even in the ancient past? Well, as is fairly well established, uh, most of the world has been inhabited by humans from uh, waves of migration out of Africa. And first they were on foot, but um, over time people developed ways of sailing both with the wind and against the wind. And one aspect of the human condition is this ability to adapt to almost every environment. And I think one aspect of that adaptability is learning how to navigate in different environments by using natural clues where the sun is, the stars, uh, the wind directions, and it's almost a kind of scientific or empirical way of thinking that I think has carried us through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Each of us is a navigator, and we are constantly finding our ways in our environment, as you said so well in the book. Of course, there are many cultures that have found their ways of adapting, and, and their, their systems or techniques may not have been as sophisticated as some other cultures, but uh, there are three cultures that kind of stand out, or, you know, the obviously the Nordic culture and the Arab traders and the Pacific Islanders. Would you uh, give us a little bit of overview of how each one of them found their way of covering the vast distances? Well, it, it is environmentally dependent. The navigators in the central Pacific, um, close to the equator, couldn't use the sun because the sun is high in the sky and doesn't provide a good reference. So they would use a kind of toolkit, which were stars at night if it wasn't cloudy, but if it was cloudy or during the day, they would use ocean swells uh, as a primary way of finding their way. And sometimes they would sight birds that would be, um, that would nest in land and then they would fly back to land. So if they could get within, oh, I don't know, 50 miles of an island, then they could pick up uh, birds and follow them. So that's very specific to that um, equatorial environment in the Pacific. The Vikings, because they voyaged in the North Atlantic, mostly during the summer months, they couldn't see stars because the sun didn't set in effect. And so the, the sun was their primary reference. And so if you read some of the sagas of the Vikings, and their voyages across the North Atlantic, there are constant references to the sun. So this was uh, primary for them. And they even had something called a sunstone, which allowed them to look at the polarization of the sky. Even when it was cloudy, some polarization persists through the fog and use that. And then the Arab traders would, as far as we can tell, did a technique called latitude sailing or running down the latitude. So they would sight the, the, the height of Polaris above the horizon using um, just their fingers in some cases, and then keep the altitude of Polaris constant and sail across the Indian Ocean uh, as a way of finding their way across. So, so those are three examples, and you can see that each one of them developed different techniques, which was key to um, the environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The culture of navigation is very specific to the environment and the mode of travel. I mean, these some of these cultures and their techniques look very primitive, but they're still very effective and they still work even today. Oh, yes. In fact, there are revivals of these cultures of navigation that are going on in a number of places. Um, one of the early groups that um, tried to put this together was a, the, the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and they were able to tap into the navigational knowledge of a, 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 a man from uh, the Caroline Islands, Mal Piailug, and he taught one of the um, Hawaiians, Nanoa Thompson, his skills in navigation, and Nanoa then went on to teach other navigators in the Polynesian Voyaging Society, and we're seeing a real revival of this throughout the Pacific in, in different uh, island cultures like the Eastern Solomons and uh, Samoa and uh, the Marshall Islands. Likewise, there's there's a revival in voyaging going on in Denmark and Norway, where they're trying to reproduce uh, the voyages across the North Atlantic that the Norse had. So it, it seems like it really speaks to the human condition that we've been doing this all our lives, and now 
kind of rediscovery of it seems to be reinvigorating a sense of culture. Um, hard to quantify it exactly, but but everywhere people started to engage in this, it, it seems to have really energized them and made them think more about uh, the roots. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what happens to that navigator or that human being or us uh, when we travel and when we are more aware of our environment and our surrounding? How the brain react to it? Well, the the part of the, the the mind which is involved in navigation is um, called the hippocampus, and that has multiple roles. One is is uh, a cognitive map of our surroundings. It's sort of as if you were on a magic carpet and you were looking down at where you are, and were able to pick out different locations, um, a mountain here, a river there, that kind of thing. Um, but that also functions in a role of um, what's called episodic memory, uh, which are memories that you can recall kind of consciously, so the face of the teacher that you had in high school or something like that, but also in planning for the future as well. So at first, if you are getting adept at navigation in an environment or new environments, um, you get a greater awareness of what's going on around you. But it's quite possible that because the same modes of thought are uh, recapitulated, that you may be stimulating the, the, the mind in ways that, that help your memory or help you think about the future. And just to illustrate that, you can think about future planning or conversations which involve metaphors about space, like don't go there or uh, they're close together or they're far apart or um, what are you getting at, things like that. And of course, in today's environment, uh, people think that watching stars or uh, paying attention to wind or the uh, the oceans is, is not very effective or is not very useful. And in fact, someone may laugh at you or, or think that you're just uh, haven't really advanced it. But reality is quite different. Yeah, I, I think that one of the one of the big issues is that people will get lost and because they haven't practiced this as I wouldn't say a hobby, but there's kind of a, a mindfulness. And, and if you practice it as a kind of mindfulness, it becomes second nature. But then you may have to call on it in, in, in an emergency, and it's the only thing in your toolkit. And I guess, as, as I said in my book, there was this, this, this horrible incident where I was out kayaking and uh, a fog bank rolled in, and I was able to find my way back to land because I was paying attention to the direction of the wind. But... There were two young women who were kayaking about, or they launched about half a mile from where I was paddling, and they evidently got lost in the fog and perished. And so uh, you don't know when something like that's going to come up, and, and then it's a matter of life and death. So there's, there's a kind of an active habit of being mindful of your surroundings that can be very important and also, also fulfilling, putting away the cell phone when you're walking <laughs> somewhere and, you know, looking at, at the shadows. And, and I just do it as a matter of habit. Um, and, and I find it, uh, you know, very fulfilling. And, and I think we, we wall ourselves off from our environment uh, too much these days. And of course, the shadows will tell you where, which direction the sun is beaming from or going in what direction. And of course, the wind direction tells you uh, what direction, uh, what, where, where we are located or where our surroundings are going to be. Yes, and, and cultures have done this uh, historically. Um, I mean, if we just take wind as one example, the Pacific Islanders would have the notion of a wind compass. And you can tell something about the direction the wind's blowing from, from the character we, we name the wind directions from where they're blowing. So here in Boston, where I live, if the wind's blowing out of the southwest, it's, it's warm and, and moist because it's coming from the Gulf of Mexico. If the wind is, is cold and dry, it's usually coming from the northwest, which is coming from the center of, of North America. But the Pacific Islanders weren't the only one. Um, the Inuit in northern Canada and Greenland would look at uh, ridges of, of snow, because as the wind blows, it kind of creates these little ripples on the wind, and, and it becomes something of a, an engraver's plate that will give you something of the history of the wind over a period of time. And another example, which I, I hadn't thought about too much, but I was out in the Sahara Desert on um, riding on camels, 
and I noticed the same phenomenon. The, the ripples appear in the sand, and the shape of the dunes are sculpted by the uh, prevailing winds. So here's just one simple phenomenon, the wind and its effect on the water or snow or sand. It's everywhere, and you can use it. Um, mm. So that's just one example of, of a phenomenon that we all experience, and then depending on where you are, you can, you can use it to your advantage. You know, we all live very busy life, and many of us are very work-focused and commute and go from a point A to point B without realizing what is in between. And if we don't have our GPS or our phone, and if we were to travel that same distance, we may not reach to the destination. What happens to us uh, when we are lost? So let me just start by <laughs> describing what, what I think is the process of not getting lost. And so we decide we're going to go from one place to another, and we have this, this kind of map in our mind. And then we download, if you like, a set of landmarks. So we live in a two-dimensional environment, most of us anyway. And, and when we travel, we're, we're traveling in a straight line. And so there are a set of landmarks that we sort of check off sequentially as we move along. And we're constantly comparing that to what we have in, in our mind as a map. So when you get lost, all of a sudden, the landmarks don't correlate with this, this mental map in your head. And we try to match them up. And sometimes, I guess, people will engage in, in a practice called bending the map, which is thinking that they know where they are when they really aren't. And so they'll say, well, the stream is flowing north, but it's actually flowing west or something like that, and they'll fool themselves. And then when there's a breakdown between what you think things are and what you're seeing or what you're experiencing, then um, a kind of anxiety or panic sets in. And in, in the West, uh, it's called wood shock. Uh, but it's not limited to Western culture. You'll see it um, in other cultures, like the Marshall Islanders have a name for being lost at sea, um, which is an anxiety. Uh, the Norse had a, a name for it, and, and even jet pilots have a word for what happens when they lose their sense of the horizon. So so this, this anxiety of not being able to uh, correlate what's in your mind and what you're experiencing in the environment can give people um, great problems and you have to actively fight the panic when that sets in and start to think about what happened. And as you bring it up in the book that uh, we are relying on a little box that is in our hand and we have taught ourselves to follow the instructions rather than learn to be environmentally aware so that we can absorb and reach to the destination without the box. But apparently we just have become too reliant on the box, which is the smartphone. Uh, but it may be doing a lot of unsmart things to your brain, and that could affect that could have effect on other things. Would you kind of expand on that a little bit? Sure. Well, um, let me start out with one study that's rather famous. In 2005, a woman at uh, UC London, Eleanor McGuire, published a study of taxicab drivers in London, and they have to memorize all the streets in London and be able to rather rapidly figure out what's the best route to take from one spot to another. And that, that part of the brain, the hippocampus, is enlarged in the taxi drivers because they've been using it. And so a, a lot of thought, the way we think, is a matter of habit. So if we keep thinking in a certain modality, it's kind of like exercising in a sense. You know, you build up muscles, whether you'll build up the, the, the thought muscles, as it were. So since, since the hippocampus... Um, is a part of the brain which is also involved in, in memory, episodic memory, um, and also future planning and imagining, it's probably likely that the, the act of, of constantly relying on a cell phone not only degrades or, or you aren't using the cognitive map, the ability to navigate, but you're also probably losing other modalities of thought, um, like your ability to remember things or your ability to plan for the future. And so we're kind of walling ourselves off not only from our environment, from parts of our brain as well, which is somewhat frightening, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. What switches off us in, in, in taking the subtle environmental clues that always exist around us, but we start relying more and more on the uh, instructions or the directions or the soft tone that tells you now turn right on this 100 feet. Uh, are we becoming more and more lazy because of that mentally, or are we just uh, tuning out, or...? 
Well, there's probably a substitution of, of you know, other other modalities. I guess if you're, you're you're tuning things out by using your cell phone, one of the things you're probably losing is is the big picture. In order to get from one point to another, um, you have to kind of have an image of the totality of where you are, if you like. And there's a certain density of information. So now, if you're just saying, "Well, turn right here, turn left there," you're you're looking at a very narrow focus, and you you aren't really thinking about that. Maybe you're doing that so that you can text a friend, or you know, I don't know what. But but there are probably other modalities of thought that may be substituting for that. Um, you know, I can't say if that that's good or bad, but it means that we're thinking in ways that our brains hadn't evolved for. Uh, put it that way. Switching back to olden ways or ancient ways of how things were done, how the maps were created and how they were used uh, by these navigators. I guess as there was more and more practice and as there was more and more users, they became more familiar and they just became more and more accurate, I guess. Yeah, it, it depends in part on, on the environment and the culture. I mean, the maps tend to reflect the culture of navigation to some extent. So I can give you two examples. In the Marshall Islands, which are right in the middle of um, the Pacific Ocean, they developed a culture of navigation that is based on looking at um, ocean swells and waves and the way the ocean swells interact with the islands and atolls in the Marshalls. And so they developed a set of objects called stick charts. And the stick charts were both instructional in trying to demonstrate how the waves would interact with land, but they were also um, honest-to-God maps where um, on a lattice of sticks that were tied together, they would put shells, and the shells would represent the different islands and atolls, and so that would be a representation of, of where they were, and they're amazingly accurate. I compared one stick chart to a map of the Marshall Islands, and, and uh, with just a little bit of stretching, everything fit perfectly. Another example is what happened with the development of the magnetic compass. In roughly the 14th century, mariners started to use magnetic compasses before the compasses, magnets were kind of a curiosity, but now it became a very tangible tool of navigation. And at that time, we see a rise of, of extremely accurate charts, um, for example, of the Mediterranean and, and the North Sea. Uh, these are known as Portolan charts, and they contain a set of lines called rum lines that crisscross and are basically used to as navigational aids to tell you what, what compass point you have to sail on to get from one place to another. So, so those are two examples of, I guess, a technology and an environment that drove the use of maps as objects that would help people uh, find their way from one place to another um, as, as kind of an aid. You know, the sun and the stars and the winds and the waves have been used by, as you, as we talked about, many cultures, uh, I mean, dominantly by the, the uh, Nordic cultures and also the Arab traders and the Pacific Islanders. Let's talk a little bit about the stars, how the Arab traders found them useful and how they, they leveraged it to their advantage and also sailing in the wind, you know. So, well, let's see, the, the, the stars... I found in teaching students about the stars, it, it takes a little bit of time to get used to how they move through the sky at night. But if I were to show you a map of, let's say, North America and say, which way is north, you would probably be able to do it rather well because you've just seen these over time. What I found is that when you look at the stars at night, if you've memorized them and, and, and started to know what their positions are, their relative positions are, uh, you can orient yourself almost immediately because you just look up and you can see these, these patterns in, in, in the stars. That seems to be the case for a large number of cultures, and they all have mythologies. And at first, the mythologies of the stars, how the star patterns get up there, sound a little bit like a, a blah, blah, blah sort of thing. But if you think about it, they had the need to be able to figure out where they were and, and their orientation by looking at the stars. And so the, the mythologies actually are a kind of code for uh, memorization, that aid the memorization so you can look up and you know exactly where you are. The Arab traders we know used Polaris, and they would use a technique called latitude sailing. So to sail from, let's say, the Arabian Peninsula to a spot in India, they would find the corresponding latitude 
of uh, their destination, and then they would keep the altitude of Polaris above the horizon fixed as they would sail, let's say, from west to east, and just use their fingers, the width of their fingers and an outstretched arm to keep the altitude of Polaris constant. In the case of Pacific Islanders, they would use the stars as a kind of sailing direction from one place to another. So in the Marshall Islands, just as an example, uh, the Southern Cross goes by the name Bubawin Abon, which means the black triggerfish of Abon, which is the southernmost atoll. So by sailing towards the Southern Cross, they would arrive at, at this uh, southernmost atoll of Abon. So those are some examples. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, many of us live in the urban societies and where people think that they may not be able to see the stars and they may not be able to spot any, but anything, but that is really not the case. If you are looking for it, you will find it. Yeah, this this is a common misconception, and I run up run up run up against this um, all the time. One of the problems is is light pollution, but that's not so bad. What I do with my students is, is we at Harvard we're in Cambridge, and it's near the city of Boston, and people think that you can't possibly see the stars. But I have them memorize the positions of um, about 33 major navigational stars, and then. The, the quiz, so-called, is we go to the roof of the Science Center at Harvard at night, and then they have to identify the stars. And there's something of a sense of amazement that they can actually see all these stars. I mean, some students will see, uh, pick out 15 or 16 stars at just one moment of uh, the night, and, and in some cases they've actually gone beyond the stars that I've assigned to them, and they've actually found, you know, memorized more stars than I, I gave them. And uh, it's it's actually really refreshing because it's discovering kind of part of our heritage as humans and also the fact that this isn't walled off to us um, in the cities as a lot of people just expect. It's a question of knowing that you can see it. And once you know you can see something, then you're able to, to see it. People may not realize that when you become environmentally aware, it also has your has an enormous impact on your spatial memory, but also to a larger extent other long-term memory and that aids you in future planning. That connection has been lost, and many people uh, may not realize how profound that could be. And as you were talking in the book, and 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 you pointed out as well, that there are some serious. Uh, benefits that we all have to our advantage, but we seem to just ignore it. Can you kind of draw that connection and explain to people or listeners uh, why this is important? Well, let's see. The the best example that, that I can give is it's developing. Uh, Eleanor McGuire, who did this work with the London taxi cab drivers, she's put together a, um, a, a kind of conjecture about how the the mind works, which involves not only this um, episodic memory, but also future planning as well. And it seems that a lot of our our memory is is based around um, spatial concepts. And um, one example of that is there's this method of uh, loci, which was, I guess, expounded by orators like Cicero um, in ancient Rome, suggested it. And the idea was in order to to memorize a speech where you had a lot of facts you had to be able to recall uh, at will, you you imagined a, a building and or a palace, a memory palace as it were, and then you you imagine all the rooms in the palace and the furniture, and each one of these is symbolic of uh, one of the things that you want to memorize. So the chair represents, I don't know, somebody, who, a, a person who collects taxes, for, for lack of a better word, and um, and so there seems to be this this uh, recapitulation of the same mode of thought of spatial navigation that happens. In, in social settings, in, in how we might be uh, imagining an interaction between people. And, and so it's so, so basic that um, we seem to you know, be able to draw upon this. And so, as I alluded to earlier, I think that by exercising this one skill, which is environmental awareness and being able to travel, uh, we're actually activating other possible skills that can help us plan into the future. And, and I just found it very fulfilling myself. I, I found that after working on this um, skill set, I was very aware and I started to see people who were carrying their cell phones around 
and uh, they seemed to be sleepwalking. And I almost wanted to shake them and say, you know, tell them that uh, their lives were in danger because they um, weren't paying attention to what was going on. There's a lot that we can learn also from the currents and the waves. Uh, what can we learn or how we can read the waves? Well, this is a skill that we see in the Marshall Islands, probably it developed in its height there, but also the Polynesian Voyaging Society used it. So let's see, how, how do I put it? When, when the wind blows across the water, it creates waves. And initially, they're very small, and it, over time, the waves uh, will build up, and they'll break, and they'll become longer and longer and longer. And depending on where you are and what the weather conditions are, even distant storms can produce waves that will travel thousands and thousands of miles. So if you're in the middle of the Pacific, you may see waves that are coming from the east, which are blown by the trade winds, and they have relatively short periods of about eight seconds between crests, but then you may see longer waves that have periods of, of maybe 15 seconds between crests, and those are driven by storms in the North Pacific. And then uh, you may get waves from the Southern Ocean, which is this patch of ocean which surrounds Antarctica, where there are incredibly strong storms, and there are even much longer, um, maybe periods of 20 seconds between them. So you have this whole environment of these different waves that each one has a character that you can read, but then they can interact with land. So you may have an island or a cluster of islands to your south, and they uh, basically will, will kill the swell from the south. So you see all of a sudden you're, you're north of this patch of islands and the southern swell disappears, and, but you still see the trade wind swell and the swell from the North Pacific. So that you can see that, and, and it's a habit that you can get into and start to read them. I, off the coast of Cape Cod, where uh, I kayak, or the coast of Maine, um, I can identify different swell systems. If there's a storm out in the Atlantic, for example, I can identify waves that are, are um, reflecting off the coastline. And it's, it's teachable, and you know what seems random at first all of a sudden conveys a tremendous amount of information and it takes time and, and you know certain patents to be able to build this up but it, it's a teachable skill and for those of us who are fortunate enough to be near the ocean um, it's very enriching to, to see that. We are all wanderers and we like to go and explore and we like to absorb and we like to enjoy what we do but are there instruments that you think now that could supplement into our making us more environmentally aware rather than making us more dependent on those uh, instruments? Well, I mean, we can use our bodies to start off with as, as, as instruments. Um, and, and I'm quite serious. One of the things I teach my students is if you extend your arm and um, your, your fingers or your hand will cover a certain angular width, and you can use that as a way of estimating your distance to uh, another object. So um, where I'm standing right now, I'm looking at a neighbor's house, and I can see that three fingers is equivalent to two stories in their house. And I know that a story in a house is about 10 feet tall, so um, I know that the house is uh, probably about 100 feet from where I am right now. And so you can you can play this game with uh, estimating distances just with your outstretched fingers and hands. Uh, if you want to become a little bit more sophisticated, uh, a magnetic compass is, is great because it can always tell you which way is north. You have to develop a little bit of skill and understanding that the compass needle doesn't always point directly to the north, but it points along the Earth's magnetic field. But once you understand that and understand how much it varies from due north, uh, you can start to use that regularly, and um, it's, a, it's a great skill to have. I should mention that GPS um, devices will fail in a number of ways. For example, the database that it draws from uh, is wrong. This, this happens frequently, but in other cases, the strength of the reception from the satellites that are beaming the information can, can go out, and um, the signal-to-noise ratio in GPS units is relatively weak, and so they will fail. Batteries will fail. The receiver will fail. But um, a compass, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth, is always there, and once you learn how to use it, um, 
you're, you're off to the races. And then there are other instruments that you can put together or use, like things that can measure the altitude of stars or the sun, uh, like a sextant, but cruder devices, and um, employ those. And um, I know a lot of people that are rediscovering celestial navigation using these tools, and um, they find it very enriching because it's tangible. It's not just pushing a button and saying you're here. <laughs> it involves some practice and understanding. <laughs> The, the the distant ancestors uh, were not very good at, at especially the navigating cultures. Uh, they were not very good at keeping records of uh, of uh, how they managed to travel such such vast distances without the help of uh, devices that we use in the modern technological age. For you to go and put all this together is not an easy task because there is no one place where you can go to a library and pull these things out. So. How difficult and challenging it was to put all this thing together? Uh, it was very challenging. Um, in, in some cases, I had to go back to um, the um, sagas, the Greenland sagas, which were recorded in Icelandic. And there they are more focused on kind of the culture, you know, who who killed who <laughs> and that sort of thing. But but if if you if you go back to the original uh, Icelandic and read it. There are uh, all these little passages that will um, tell you how they thought, and you have to be able to kind of think, put yourself in their shoes, and and see what they were saying. There was um, in coming to North America. There was a very brief period where the Norse came to North America, and they talked about the passage of the sun in the sky as a way of determining their latitude, and so go way back to, to the original language and then understand the practice of people in Iceland, let's say from the beginning of the 19th century, of using the sun as a way of, of telling time, for example. So it tells time and it also tells direction. And so it's a puzzle. I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating puzzle. Another case, I found a table of latitudes and longitudes um, from the Middle Ages that had been published and, and in that era, people use latitudes and longitudes for astrology, for example, uh, or knowing how to face Mecca. And a question I was curious about was what what was the knowledge of, of the world at that point? And so I did a mathematical fit of the prime meridian, that is to say, right now in Greenwich, the zero of our longitude goes through Greenwich, England. But back in that era, we didn't know what they used as the prime meridian, which was in their schema the westernmost known point of land and in doing the fit what just popped out of the numbers was that the cape verde islands seemed to be the location of the prime meridian and if you go to a history book at least now people will say that the cape verde islands were unknown until 1460 but here's um, a table of numbers that comes from i guess about the 12th century that tells you the cape verde islands were, were known back then so so it's it's a puzzle and you have to keep scratching your head and scratching around for all sorts of little pieces of evidence that you can use to uh, figure out what went on. So, um, as you say, it's not in any one library. <laughs> it's just a question of being rather persistent and then finding clever ways of, of, of you know, deducing what's going on. I mean, obviously you had to rely on so many archaeological archaeological digs or... or, or uh non-conventional or unexpected places to find them, some of the hymns or some of the uh, sagas or some of the songs yep. or passages, which some of the languages that are not no longer in existence today? Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, it's an arduous and difficult task. Yeah, no, it, it is, it is. And the question is, what, <laughs> what drives me? And I think I think really it's a sense of, of getting back in touch with with our humanness, for lack of a better term. One thing I did was to compare, look at the etymology of the derivation of the words for the cardinal points, east, west, north, and south. And invariably, if, if you push back far enough, you'll find that there are environmental clues, um, like east is, is in a lot of languages the direction of the rising sun in a lot of northern or European languages. South is midday, or the word for sun, because the sun reaches its highest point in the sky in the middle of the day, for example. And it's, it's a challenge, but it's also, I don't know, very energizing because there are all these things that are part of our common heritage 
about the way people thought and sort of rediscovering that is, um, I don't know, energizing for me in any case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have been speaking with Professor John Hewitt, the author of The Lost Art of Finding a Way. So much about the book. Tell us a little bit more about, uh, about yourself. How did you get into this? Uh, what attracted you to be in physics? And where do you see going yourself further? Well, I'm nominally, I'm a, I'm a particle physicist. So I do work at the um, a place called the Large Hadron Collider, which is um, uh, an accelerator in Geneva, Switzerland. I guess it started out with me being rather adept with experiments for lack of a better term, and, and being able to put put numbers to observations that we have in the environment. And and I guess I was just driven by, I guess, I don't know how to put it, you know, there's a certain mystery about how things work in the world and um, just want to keep carrying on. I, I remember that when I was young, I read this passage in um, the book of Job, which was where God reveals himself to Job and says, among other things, who made the wisdom of the of the inward parts, which is an interesting phrase in Hebrew. And so I guess there was a sense that there's kind of this intelligence all around us. I mean, it's probably not intelligence in the common way that we think of it uh, as human intelligence, but how the world works um, seems to have, it does seem to be suffused with a kind of intelligence of sorts. And And so I guess... For me, physics has just been this, this never-ending journey into trying to understand how the world's put together, and, and I think that probably pushed me along. In, in terms of the navigation, it was an encounter with the unfortunate deaths of two young women who were out kayaking in, in a fog bank, and they, they perished, and I made my way back to land because I paid attention to the direction of the wind. And there was a certain degree of survivor's guilt that I suffered from after that incident that was in 2003. And there was this sort of constant questioning of lie, which is a very human sort of thing to do. But of course, there's no real answer. And um, I then became somewhat obsessed with navigation as I'm doing it, um, as a, I guess, in a sense of uh, using environmental clues. And by studying it more, it, it, it kind of worked the, the whole incident out of my system, I suppose. And, um, and then I just found it to be extremely rich and, um, and nobody's been doing it. So I said, okay, this, this looks like it's worth pursuing. Uh, are you looking to explore any other uh, topics or, or subtopics within the navigation to uh, uh, write another book? Yes, well, let's see. Um, I have two, two navigation, semi-navigation projects going on. One was in, in working on the uh, book, I worked with a, um, or I, I started working with an anthropologist from the University of Hawaii, Joe Gens, and he did his uh, PhD thesis on the navigational culture in the Marshall Islands, in particular interviewing some of the local navigators there. And as I said, they rely on um, waves, swells, and the way they interact with um, the islands. And... Um, I went out there with Joe and an expert on the computer simulation of waves, and we interviewed some of the last remaining traditional navigators and took a voyage between two of the uh, atolls using traditional techniques. And one of the things that we're going to do um, in a couple of months is get together with the uh, one of the traditional navigators and, and um, Joe and the guy who does the computer simulations. and. We think we're on the cusp of being able to um, explain in Western terms how they navigated from one place to another. So that's one project. Another project that emerged in working on the book was the idea that social cognition uh, seems to follow spatial cognition. And so you can see this in everyday language like, um, don't go there, you're on a slippery slope, they're close together, they're far apart. And it turns out that as far as I can tell, every language that humans speak contain this uh, parallelism between social cognition and spatial cognition. And so um, I'm exploring that in a book and also teaching a freshman seminar. And what's interesting is that as our horizons grow uh, and we have new concepts of space, 
new concepts of, of social relations naturally emerge, and um, it's rather astonishing to me, but it seems to be the case. And so I follow that from the development of ancient astronomy and find that there are actually um, social or cultural metaphors that emerge even from modern concepts of physics, which I didn't think was possible, but <laughs> once I examine it, there they are. Well, they're all linked somewhere, but you just don't know where they are, and this is a nice way of navigating through them as well. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you very much for your time, okay. and uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.